name is Susanna Altenburger. I come from Gloucester. I represent Phil Boat in France. We've been designing boats out of Gloucester for the last 60 years. Um, we're currently at the tail end of a project that was initiated by the U.S. Navy, was engaged in by the city of Gloucester as a no-brainer opportunity to show their profile of orientation and was finally added to by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under the Division of Marine Fisheries. It happens to be a very low carbon device. It's an experimental craft for the Navy. And in the final uh, stage of the, of, of the project, the state will end up owning the boat as one of the research types. The reason why I'm bringing this up is in, in our work for the last 10 years trying to raise awareness on every possible level in print, in wordage, including my thumbprint that weighs probably here today, is that there's no federal or state programs that address low carbon fishing or any other commercial devices out there. When you are dealing with the universal fisheries, which particularly looking along the New Jersey shoreline, but also south of Massachusetts, you will have a certain amount of encounters with certain interests. And while you may not hear from the industry per se that green fishing boats are the primary motivation, you will probably not hear that, I think it might help smooth your ride if there was to be a parallel, a concurrent program initiated by NIMS, by NOAA, and Ms. Lubchenko, to do this. Uh, to, to offer certain incentives for people to migrate towards devices so they can see that eco is not just the label of the adversaries in the regulatory realm, but it's actually, as many enlightened fishermen understand, they've always known that, it's actually one way to coexist and make the most of a situation which you actually want to be in early and often. Ironically, I was, I was invited last November in 2010 to speak as one of the only folks in Northeast small business people at the first international conference on energy use in commercial fishing, organized by Ms. Lubchenko. But at that occasion, there still was no governmental program that was engaging on the notion of low carbon fishing vessel research, or for that matter, any other waterborne commerce vessels. It's being left somewhere to somebody else, and it's not happening in Europe, it's not happening in Asia, it's not happening here. And I think you may want to initiate with Ms. Lubchenko something that runs concurrent to what you're trying to do. Otherwise, I think you'll run into a whole lot of folks will be hollering and screaming in case you haven't already experienced some of that. They may be still quieter, but eventually folks will move maybe more rigorously. So it would help us, and it might help everybody involved. Thank you for your patience. Uh, hi, I'm also a resident of the I just have some quick comments. I'm not a technical expert, but I have been working with Ms. Lubchenko for the last year, and I'm
again, thank you for holding uh, uh, this uh, public meeting hearing on the uh, call area. And Mass Audubon supports Secretary Salazar's smart from the start on the Noble Energy Program as it advances America's offshore renewable policy to achieve 10 gig gigawatts of wind energy from the other continental shelf and Great Lakes uh, by 2020, even though we realize the Great Lakes not on the earth, but it is part of the, uh, of the process, or as we in Massachusetts like to call it, wicked spot for the state. <laughs> we, also support, we also support the intent of the call area, subject to further environmental studies required to inform you on the conditions that are, that are necessary. And we simultaneously encourage you to move forward with the lease sale process and not stop things pending uh, the need for those uh, studies. Uh, as an appointed member of the Habitat Working Group uh, that you mentioned earlier, uh, we appreciate uh, the fact that you looked at the request for information, the request for interest area, took our recommendations, including those regarding the presence of long-tailed ducks, and cut the area to a present size by as much as 50%. And we look forward to working with you on further refinement of this area in, in, the, uh, in the individual blocks. Um, we commented on that uh, earlier um, uh, stage, and we'll be providing written comments on this stage as well, uh, formal, formal comments. And our Mass Audubon's review of this project, the Cape Wind project, and other um, uh, projects that we're looking at across the country um, are, held with the, are done within the context of rapid climate change. We see the burning of fossil fuels, uh, use of natural gas and oil that release heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide and, and methane as, as heat trapping pollution. Um, and we think that uh, the burning of fossil fuels results in not only release of these gases, but mercury that bioaccumulates in the atmosphere and is a public health issue, especially for pregnant women and children. And we see rising sea level. Uh, we see accelerated storms or intense storms, um, uh, rare species, uh, threatened species such as piping plovers, endangered species of rosea, such as rosea terns that nest around the shoreline uh, of Cape Cod and the islands and other areas of coastal Massachusetts, threatened by increased erosion levels, increased sea levels to the point where uh, we're seeing accelerated uh, reduction in those numbers, partially as a result of sea level rise and increased storm activity on those low-lying habitats. Uh, so again, we're looking at mitigation for climate change, and one of the best, most reliable methods of mitigation against climate change is wind energy. As a third most densely populated state in the nation, we don't think we can gain a lot of megawatts of renewable wind energy from land-based wind. Uh, we think we can do that from offshore, especially with the prospect uh, for deep water uh, offshore uh, opportunities. Um, I would say that uh, over the last decade, uh, we provided you with quite a bit of information. Mass Audubon's had a contractual relationship with uh, the Norris Management Service, now Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, provide you information on sea ducks. Uh, we're looking forward to increased information, both from studies that were done in the past, studies that are ongoing now, and those that will be started up in 2012, that will inform you as you make uh, different decisions on different areas of, this, of the lease sale process. Uh, we're particularly uh, want to express uh, the fact that not only during the uh, planning analysis and leasing stage, but uh, after characterization, assessment, once the commercial development stage happens, we also encourage you to continue to provide data, to look at any data gaps that may be existing, and to fill those data gaps, and do that in a very public way. So along with the Massachusetts Clean Energy uh, uh, Center that's doing some studies offshore in connection with um, uh, Professor Dick Fee, looking at gross returns and long-term life, and that information can continue uh, to form you uh, with what you do. And also as a member of the, uh, as a gubernatorial, gubernatorial appointee to the Massachusetts Ocean Advisory Commission, I would encourage you to share this data and work closely uh, with the National Ocean Council that's advancing the President's July Executive Order on Coastal Marine Spatial Planning, because I think they can both work together in tandem and inform each other. And we look forward to uh, uh, working with you as the process continues. Thank Here you. is uh, Charles Mayo with the Center of Principles and Studies. Uh, again, thanks to uh, both for giving us a chance to talk. I've already spoken to you a few times, and uh, this time on the record. So I wanted to raise a concern, uh, but to actually come up with a preamble that follows on the chat of previous speakers, and that is most of us working in marine systems 
rapid development of wind energy. Uh, great concern about what's happening to our ecosystem. This year's uh, uh, one of those odd years which may be speaking to the future of green mammals in the Cod area. Uh, and perhaps a reflection on changes in climate. Um, a very odd year to be sure in the ocean. Uh, so I'm very much in support personally of, of the efforts that, uh, that you're undertaking and uh, looking whether the slings and arrows. Um, however, uh, and there is a however, uh, the issue that I have expressed to you before uh, relates to the lack of information about marine mammals. Uh, in particular, the species that I deal with, the North Atlantic right whale, uh, has the potential for stopping virtually everything that's going on because of the power of the Endangered Species Act. So I think it's to the benefit of those of us who want to see uh, the development of wind energy offshore uh, to recognize that we must come uh, to firm grips with the extraordinary lack of information about that, one of the rarest of all the mammals on Earth. Um, it is, uh, uh, it's often said that data on marine mammals just does not mean the absence of marine mammals. And at present, there is a very uh, powerful effort going on right now, supported by the state, to look at the region uh, with overflights and acoustic buoys to try to see if they can track down the right whales. The best available data that's before you on which you're making decisions is pretty poor, uh, close to close to useless. Uh, the information collected this year by the New England Aquarium will likely uh, add a great deal of, uh, to the uh, deliberations, uh, but it uh, is, as most of us working in ecological sciences know, uh, not going to fill the gaps. Uh, one year does not make the story, and this year is the oddest year, at least for the right whales that I'm working on uh, in these days, in Cape Cod Bay, it is uh, the oddest year so the work by the England Aquarium uh, and others who might do the survey work uh, to inform you should go on a pace. I worry about the process moving along and us being trapped in some ways a little bit as Cape Wind was. Uh, it would be, uh, I think, a tragedy if we discover aggregations of whales and particularly discover what they're doing there and find out uh, that it uh, is creating a major problem for the further advance of, uh, of your efforts. So I would encourage you then uh, just to try to answer as quick as you can while you're developing all this answers to two questions. You ask the question, one is where are the marine mammals? And as important, if you're going to assess uh, the consequences of the project, uh, you need to ask what are they doing there? Uh, that is the issue that will be before you, and I encourage you to get those answers quicker uh, than we've had them before to extend the studies. Thank you. Uh, Edward Wall. Hi, my name is Edward Wall. I'm here on behalf of myself, uh, and thank you for holding this uh, hearing. Uh, I do support offshore wind, and I support it for some reasons that haven't been articulated. One is the use of wind will take volatility out of energy pricing for this region uh, and will also cement this region's leadership in renewable energy efforts. Uh, secondly, um, uh, I wish there were some way you could write your report to assure that some of the manufacturing that takes place for these pieces of equipment occurs in Massachusetts or the region. I'm not sure that's within your scope of authority, but the more you can encourage that, the better. Uh, one of the reasons that the cost of wind is predictable is that it has a certain price point. Uh, the cost of gas is going up. It's going to go up higher as we uh, see exports of shale gas going to Europe, which pays a lot more per kilowatt hour of gas than we do in this country. And you'll find a lot of uh, uh, what used to be intake pipes for fuel coming to this country being turned into export pipes for gas because that's where the profit lies for shale gas 
and other gases. So the faster you get along with approving these offshore wind energy facilities, the more control we'll have over the price of, of energy. One thing that's always befuddled me is when you deliver the price of fossil fuel energy to a home is why those fossil fuel plants oppose tax energy credits for renewable energy. Uh, because since all the fossil fuels uh, plants have a requirement to have part of their portfolio be renewable energy, tax credits can only reduce the price of the consumer. So maybe there's some way you can encourage in your report the generation and the continuation of tax credits for renewable fuel that can only reduce the total cost of energy to the consumer, uh, and that will ensure a more predictable price of energy for both this region as well as this country. So please get on with your task. Uh, you're doing a great job so far, and we look forward to a quick resolution and approval of wind energy down in the south. Next Florida. speaker is uh, uh, Nick Lewis. Hi, um, my name is Nick Lewis. I'm uh, from RPS Energy, which is one of the biggest consultancies in Europe. Um, we've been involved with uh, wind energy in, in Europe since before round one in the UK. I have a question rather than actual comment. It, it does tie into the actual uh, the analysis of, uh, of cumulative impacts, and it relates back to the, the, uh, the comment on, uh, on the right whales. Given that the, uh, the leases have a 25 year time span, are you going to be looking at that in the EIS? Of all uh, available, all uh, biological resources that are or use 